Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Dr. Paul Grady. I'm an associate professor of history here at University of South Carolina Upstate. And on behalf of the Department of History, Political Science, Philosophy, and American Studies, I would like to welcome all of you to USC Upstate and, and express our appreciation for you spending your evening uh, at this important, uh, uh, important event. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing the host of tonight's evening, uh, who is the Chancellor of USC Upstate, Dr. Tom Moore. Thank you, Dr. Grady. Uh, I, I'm really, really pleased to see this many people out on a, what's today, Tuesday evening to celebrate the U.S. Constitution. Uh, Constitution Day comes around once a year when we, when we celebrate the ratification of it. Events such as this happen across college and university campuses across the country and in other settings. We have developed a tradition. I want to thank Dr. Paul Grady for his efforts to promote this and make it a USC upstate tradition to bring the community to our campus to celebrate and think about the Constitution of the United States of America. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Congressman Trey Gowdy. He's a, a Spartanburg son. He left home and went to Baylor University where he majored in history and he's gotten over that. <laughs> he, he, came back, he, came, he came back to his home state to attend USC Law School. He served as a federal prosecutor. He was the solicitor from the Seventh Judicial Circuit for a number of years and in 2010 was elected US, to the U.S. House of Representatives for, from the 4th Congressional District of South Carolina. He's up for re-election. Uh, that's not why he's here tonight. Uh, but he is here to help us think about and celebrate the Constitution. His professional life has been devoted to the law, and now he works under the law and through the Constitution to make life better for all of us. Please help me welcome Trey Gowdy and thank him for being here with us tonight. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I am delighted and honored to be at USC Upstate. Uh, thank you all for coming out, um, especially young people, not to, uh, it would be stupid for me as a politician to single out those who can't vote, uh, but I especially want to thank the young people for coming out and celebrating this document. Uh, Chancellor, uh, my parents are here. Uh, my history uh, teacher from high school, uh, George Fain is here. Miss Henderson, who can regale you with stories. There are lots of people here who remind me of my youth, and they have, uh, Ms. Nixon is here, they have this in common. They are just as surprised as you are that I represent them <laughs> in Congress. They're really here to celebrate this magnificent document. And I want to strike a celebratory tone for just a minute. I want us to think about all the things this document has withstood a civil war, two world wars, a battle for gender and racial equity, 9-11, a drug epidemic, and most significantly to me, and most fascinatingly to me, the advances in technology that our forefathers, no matter how prescient they were, never could have imagined. And yet, here we still are. And yet, here it still is. With relatively few amendments. And the amendments we made were important and necessary, but in the grand scheme of things, relatively few. So as we strike that celebratory tone and we think about this magnificent document, I want to ask you a couple of questions. And at first, they're going to be rhetorical. And you may feel the desire, the impulse to speak out. Uh, resist it for just a second, because we are going to get to the audience participation part. I may single out uh, the students, um, or I may develop some mercy between now and then and not do that. But I want to ask you, as we celebrate this document, to think about what it is. Is it a neat historical document that my colleagues and I uh, frequently misquote and confuse with the Declaration of Independence, the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, or lyrics from a U2 song? 
Is this a living, breathing document, as some would tell you, that is subject to being interpreted from generation to generation? And as soon as that rolls off my tongue, you sit there and think, well, even this very room is transgenerational. So is that what it is? Do we get to renegotiate the terms of this contract every generation? Or is it still the supreme law of the land and the framework by which every judicial and legislative decision should be made? We can't do it tonight, and I'm not big on assigning reading to people who have busy lives, but I will share this with you. I was telling my high school history teacher who uh, did the best job he could, George Fain, that I love speaking to high school classes and college classes, and I spoke at Clemson on the Constitution, and the professor sent me two books to read before he would allow me to speak to his class. Uh, never had that happen before so I read them uh, and I'm better off for it because both the books were on the framing of this document and so I'll ask you how did we settle on a chief executive because they're competing theories of government right how did we settle on one and and how did we settle that that chief executive would have a four-year term because Alexander Hamilton wanted a 20-year term, and some wanted a 10-year term. And how did they decide whether or not the chief executive should be reelected or not? Because I get asked from time to time about not just term limits, but a single term. And would that change the nature of our governance? If you didn't have to worry about getting reelected, and you didn't have to worry about raising money, would it change the nature of our representation? So did our forefathers debate that? And how did they settle on a chief executive with a four-year term subject to being reelected? And as most of you know, it was later in this document's life that we put a limit on how many years you can serve or how many terms you can serve. But yet, until Franklin Delano Roosevelt, nobody served more than two terms. It wasn't the law. Why did our forefathers settle on what they settled on? The debate surrounding it, the debate surrounding whether we should allow for re-election. How about the nature by which we elect a president? I am not going to pick on Senator Al Gore tonight. Uh, I mention him only because he was in the news this week calling for an end to the Electoral College. And as all of you know, and I say all because I'm hopeful the students have had a chance to learn, we don't elect president by popular vote in this country. In fact, there have been examples of people getting the most amount of votes and not becoming the president. Um, Al Gore represents one of them. Why did our forefathers give us an Electoral College? Why did they not give us popular elections? And if you read the debate, it's because they didn't trust us. They didn't trust us to stay up on politics enough, and they thought that we would only vote for our native sons or now would-be daughters, that Virginia candidates would be preferred over other states that South Carolina would only vote for South Carolinians and wouldn't vote for any other. And I note the irony that Vice President Gore would have been President Gore had he gotten the electoral votes from his home state of Tennessee. And what would our forefathers say? Would they smile? Would they say the Electoral College is exactly what we still need? How about senators? because they set up the election of senators prior to, the, to it being amended. Your state general assembly picked your senators. We didn't get to vote on it. Would we have the same two senators that we have if the general assembly did the electing? So they were worried about nativism and they were worried that people were so busy with their everyday lives that we didn't want them to popularly elect 
senators, we wanted to leave it to the experts in the various state houses. So you go issue by issue, whether it's the judiciary or whether it's the nature of the chief executive and how we pick senators, and then we get to my favorite, which is how in the world Wyoming has the same number of senators as California. And you think one person, one vote, what offends that more than populous states having two senators and North Dakota having the same number? And you learn as you read these books, and I would encourage you to at least read one on the making of this document. You learn that they engaged in the art of compromise. Now, you have to start with certain things in common before you can reach that state of compromise. But make no mistake, there were compromises that were made. And that's how this document got created. So before we get into parts of this document, I got to ask you to think about a couple of other things. I want you to celebrate the longevity of this document. I want you to ask yourself certain questions. Why did our framers do things the way they did? What, what were they thinking? Why the Electoral College? Why two senators, but yet House members are based on population? Why did they do that? But fundamental, I think, to all of that is this question. What's the nature of this document? And before you can answer that question, you have to ask yourself, where do your rights come from? There was a letter to the editor, either in the Greenville News or the Spartanburg Herald um, recently, and someone was advocating that rights come from government. I don't think that's a mischaracterization of the letter to the editor. If you read it, you may reach a different conclusion, but, um, but, but that's one theory, that rights come from government. Or do you think that rights come from your creator? Or do rights come from nature? Because how you answer that question dictates whether or not and in what fashion your rights can be limited and by whom. So if you believe, as I do, and I'm not here to editorialize, but I believe this is a limited government document. It's a limited rights document. And the best proof I can think of for that is Article 1, Section 8, which lists, and, as the, and in the interest of full disclosure, um, or in the interest of confessing it, I guess, I have worked in all three branches of government. And it is interesting how your perspective changes depending on which branch of government you're in. Alexander Hamilton worried that the judicial branch would be the weakest of all the branches. I don't think anybody worries about that anymore. After Bush v. Gore and Sebelius versus NFIB, I don't think anybody's worried about the strength of the judiciary. But I worked in the executive branch as a prosecutor. And I worked in the, and I'm in the legislative branch now. So Article 1, Section 8, which sets out what Congress can do, and whether it's coin money or, or my favorite clause, the Commerce Clause that Congress can regulate commerce among the several states and with foreign states. And this is written, these, these words are written by men who, no matter how brilliant they may have been, never could have imagined the internet, the interconnectivity of the world that we live in. And what would they do with that interconnectivity now? Congress may regulate commerce among the several states. What does that phrase mean? Immigration, exclusively supposed to be within the province of the federal government and Congress. So what do you do when the federal government abdicates its responsibility? And you know that nature abhors a vacuum and do the states move in? And the tension between that is fascinating for me. So you've got that phrase, you've got on display just this past summer, 
and I'm not going to talk about the Affordable Care Act. If somebody has a question about it, you're welcome to ask it. But I'm not, I'm not here to talk about that decision other than um, if you haven't read the decision, and I know you're sitting there thinking, you've already asked me to read one book on the, on the making of the Constitution. Now you're asking me to read a, an opinion. Yes, I am. It is a fascinating, regardless of whether or not you agree with the outcome, uh, Justice Roberts' analysis of the Commerce Clause and whether or not there are limits on what government can do was fascinating. He reached a different conclusion in the third part of his opinion than I wished he had reached. But part one about the limitations of government I think is so important for us to think about. Last week was my wife's birthday. Uh, and once uh, my kids reminded me of that, I went to go get her a birthday card. And I encourage uh, any of you who have a spouse or a boyfriend or a girlfriend that uh, has a birthday coming up uh, to do the same. And I can tell you that if you go to certain stores, there are cards that are marked off because they don't apply to that. So instead of getting her a birthday card, I got her a Halloween card because it was less money. So it's cheap. <laughs> It's cheap, and how many of you would disagree that it is a good idea to remember your spouse or significant other's birthday? Does anybody think it's a bad idea? So can Congress pass a law when I get back tomorrow morning mandating that you provide a card for your spouse on his or her birthday? And if not, why not? Why not? You just told me it was a good idea. It doesn't cost much, 50 cents. You might can get one of your kids to make one for free until a certain age, and then they won't do it for you anymore, but why not? So one of the things I try to focus on when I'm looking and thinking about this document is, is there a difference between something being a good idea and it being a good federal idea. I met today with volunteers and others at the Children's Advocacy Center. If you ever want a, an entity to support financially and otherwise, it would be the Children's Advocacy Center. And of course, they want help. They need help. These are tough times, and people have a tendency to want to come to Washington for that help. So then you ask yourself, okay, it's a good idea to help children who have been abused. It's a good idea to provide them therapy. Is that the role of Congress? Is that the role of the state? Is that the role of county council? Does it matter who does it to you? Does this document, the limitations on the powers of the central federal government, does it mean anything? And if so, what does it mean? Because if all we're going to talk about is whether or not something's a good idea or not, and whether we can afford it, then there are no limitations. So that's my view of it. That's my view of the document. It's a limited rights document. Now I want to move to something that's more, not more fun, but more perhaps uh, relevant, the Bill of Rights. What's the First Amendment provide for you? Freedom of speech, assembly, free exercise. Anybody been watching Northern Africa in the last couple of weeks? You see on full display cultures and societies that have not struck the harmony, the balance that we have. To be able to protect speech that we find reprehensible and disagree with at every level, and yet also show tolerance towards religious views, irrespective of whether we agree with them or not, is something we do a pretty good job of in this country. We're not perfect. Uh, thus far, uh, no one's home has been stormed in the United States. But you see on full display, when you do not have the familiarity in the background, 
with free exercise, with free speech, and with tolerance, what you get. You get dead diplomats. You get civil war. So yes, it's about free speech. It's about free exercise. I want to ask you this, and this is when the rhetorical part ends and the audience participation part starts. What is the value in me being able to tell a lie? Why would our forefathers protect the ability for me to tell you that it didn't rain a drop today? It was perfect weather. Anyone who was in Spartanburg, even for a minute, knows that's a lie. But yet the First Amendment protects it. Why? Well said, but there are limitations on the First Amendment, right? You go to a movie theater and yell fire, and you will be arrested and prosecuted. If you sign a confidentiality document, contract law then trumps your First Amendment rights. You can be prosecuted or fined for breaking the confidentiality. Are there any high school students here? Here's what I want you to do tomorrow morning. Uh, preferably during math class, because I have a lot of bitterness uh, in me over that. (laughs) I want you to stand up and talk about what you want to talk about when the teacher is trying to teach you math, and you let me know, you let me know how your First Amendment rights worked out, okay? (laughs) The truth is there are limits on our First Amendment rights. The question is where do we draw them? I can't intentionally with malice to fame someone. The document itself doesn't have that, those nuances. There's no way it could be written. This is a relatively short document from, for, from a historical standpoint. I recommended a book to Mr. Fain, Mr. Fain that's about 400 pages. This is remarkably short. It cannot assume every fact pattern, which I think is part of its brilliance. So there's the First Amendment for us. And, and, and let me stay on the First Amendment, and I'm not here to make a political speech, but I do want to borrow from certain things that have happened in the last 12 months to illustrate certain points. So I want to ask this, can Congress tell you, or government tell you, what your religious beliefs ought to be? Somebody said no. I can't. Can Congress dictate to you which religious beliefs are unacceptable? I see a lot of heads shaking no. That's exactly what they're doing with the HHS. Give me a second. Give me a second. (laughs) I want to make a broader point, though. I want to make a broader point than that because I have made that point repeatedly, but, I, but I'm not going to make it tonight. I, I want to I show the nuances and the beauty of this document. I want you to assume, I'm going to pick on a judge sitting over here to the right only because he's picked on me for the majority of my career, and this may be the one opportunity I have. Judge Tommy Wall does a fantastic job in Spartanburg County, but I'm actually not going to pick on him. He's a good father. So I want you to assume that there is a set of parents that do not believe in doctors or hospitals. They just don't believe in it. I read an article today that a football player uh, refused uh, a pain shot at halftime in an SEC football game because he does not believe in uh, pain medicine. It's a, a religious issue for him. So he refused it. I want you to imagine that there are parents who have that religious belief. They believe that the Lord is the great physician and that his will be done and we are not going to go to hospitals or doctors. And I want you to imagine that you are the state and that child is deathly ill. What are you going to do?
not all at once. <laughs> yes, ma'am. All right, DSS, which is uh, an embodiment of the state. So the state's going to come and violate your religious views. And I could have sworn y'all just told me that the state can't do that. They can. No, they can. And the distinction is the state can't tell you to change your religious views. But all religious activity isn't protected. You could start a religion dedicated to smoking marijuana. Chuck Wright will probably have something to say about that. <laughs> you, you can't excuse your conduct by calling it religion. By the same token, the government cannot tell you to change your religious views. Conduct is separate from belief and views. Now, if somebody wants to ask about HHS at the end, we'll, we'll get into that. But I want to move to the Second Amendment for a second. Who can, who can tell me what the Second Amendment says? Keep and bear arms. So here's my question for you. Why did the forefathers put that in? What were they concerned about? Two things, right? A defense from a tyrannical government and self-defense. I mean, self-defense is as old as Cain and Abel, right? So, extrapolating from what you said and what you said, that it is to protect us from a tyrannical government or potentially tyrannical government, can you, under the Second Amendment, avail yourself to the full panoply of weapons that government has? Why not? Are there any limits? Can you have a nuclear weapon? I mean, everybody laughs and says no. But these are constitutional questions. That's the analysis, right? You start with the Second Amendment and you try to ascertain what does it mean to keep and bear arms. And it's interesting, there are limits on your ability to keep and bear arms. If you're a convicted felon, you can't do it. If you have been court-martialed, you can't um, have ammunition or firearms. So there are already limits on it. The beauty to me of this document is in its elasticity, and I don't mean elasticity in the way that some of my colleagues mean it. I mean elasticity in its ability to cover fact patterns that I don't think anyone ever could have reasonably imagined. So I want to repeat this, and then I'm going to conclude, and then I want to do my best to avoid whatever questions you may have. <laughs> I want you to take just a second, when you're driving home, when you're walking, whatever you're doing, and appreciate how magnificent it is that we and this despite our divisions, despite the polarization, despite whatever you want to insert, there's enough unity left that people of different political persuasions and every other persuasion can gather in a room at USC Upstate and celebrate this magnificent document because it can't be done everywhere. So don't take it for granted and especially to the young people who are going to be told that this document can be reinterpreted generation to generation. And Article 1, Section 8 that puts limits on what Congress can do. You can change those limits. If it's a good idea, we're going to do it. Health insurance is a great idea. I think you're crazy not to have it. Crazy not to have it if you can afford it. And if you can't afford it, there ought to be a way for us to get it to you. The question is, is the way constitutional or not? And when we skip over that question, when we go from good idea to implementation, in my judgment, you risk violating the supreme law of the land. Do it the right way through the right channel of government.
There's a reason, there's a central government, there's a state government, there's a county council. I assume there's a student government here, right? Any students here? Do y'all do the electoral college or do y'all do direct vote? Yeah, I didn't, there's no electoral, I would not think anybody else would try the electoral college. But here's what I want you to do, especially to the young people. If you drove tonight, the fact that the USC Public Safety Department is not searching your car right now, probably, <laughs> is because the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution 225 years ago, and it's still working for you. If heaven forbid anybody here is charged with a crime, the fact that the police cannot beat a confession out of you is because some prescient people got together 225 years ago and decided that doesn't reflect our values. The right to counsel, the right to a jury trial, the right to avoid cruel and unusual punishment, and then the Ninth and Tenth Amendments deal with those rights that aren't specifically enumerated or mentioned. And who do they devolve to? The people and the states. So when you run into people, and you will from time to time, and they will quote phrases that are beautiful, they are elegant, they're in the Constitution, the General Welfare Clause, the Necessary and Proper Clause, the tax and spend clause, which is how Chief Justice Roberts ultimately decided Sebelius versus NFIB. Those clauses are beautiful and they have meaning. You have to read meaning into them. But if all we can do, if, if the only analysis is whether or not it's in the general welfare of the people, then why do we have the rest of the document? If that's all that matters, that it's in the general welfare, then why are there... Why are there more pages here? Just say that. Congress can do whatever's in the general welfare of the people, period. Save a lot of heartache for people who take constitutional law in law school. It's simple. So those clauses have to be read with the limitations wherein they are placed. And if you hadn't read the document, and it'll take you about 30 minutes, if you got time to watch Honey Boo Boo, you got time to read the Constitution <laughs> of the United States. Speaking of the First Amendment, apparently it's broad enough to include that too. So celebrate it, study it. I'm not going to tell you to do both, but either read the opinion, the, the majority opinion and the dissent in, in Sebelius versus the, NFL, the Affordable Care Act. But if you can get your hands on an internet article or a book and listen to the debate and the prominent role that South Carolina played in this debate, those brilliant minds that all got together, they had to have enough in common to stay in the room with each other. And that's important too. All we do these days is talk about what divides us and how different we are. And this was a pretty eclectic group of folks too. But they had enough in common that they could stay in the room and work it out. And how did we get what we got? How did we get this? And then celebrate the fact that we still got it with relatively few changes. So with that, I hope I have timed it where there are no questions. And if they are, I will do my best to answer them, Chancellor. Thank you for letting me be here. Congressman is, is willing to answer as many questions as he can, and, and uh, uh, we appreciate him doing that. Before we get to that, I, I, I am hesitant to contradict our guest speaker, but knowing many of the high school students in this room and that they're part of the Scholars Academy, please don't interrupt your math class tomorrow because I know Mrs. Grant, and that's not something you want to try. But after that's taken care of, uh, we'll, we'll open the floor to questions. I hope people will, will be patient, that I, I would like to give precedence and encourage the students in the room, but we'll, we'll take all the questions we can. But we would like the students to, to engage in uh, the question and answer session as well. Yes, sir. 
Trey, could you give us the name of the book that you made reference to that you should read in preparation? That you, you wait till you get to be my age, and you'll do well to remember that you read a book. But I, I'll, I'll tell you what, if you've got a card or a phone number or an email address, it, it's in my study at home. I'll, I'll get it, and I'll email you the name of it. it there were two. I'm still very upset with the professor who made me read two books before I went, but I'm better off because of it. I'll get you the names. In the, in the 225 years since our document was put together, a lot of things have changed. Transportation now provides people to come to this country and obtain birthrights, and they become American citizens and fly back on home. We are definitely in need of some constitutional amendments, but I read where we can do that and where we can't do it. Constitutional amendments can only be done by the Congress itself and by a majority of the states acting in concert to get into constitutional amendments. A million people with a petition cannot bring up a constitutional amendment. Help. Well, I, I don't know. What, what do you, the question, I think, is a de jure versus de facto citizenship. And most countries in Europe have what we call uh, de jure citizenship, where you have to meet a certain number of requirements to be citizens. And the current interpretation uh, of our Constitution and the historic interpretation of our Constitution includes that if you are born here, irrespective of the um, uh, residency status of your parents. If you are born here, you are an American citizen. There are some people who think that um, that is best uh, visited by the Supreme Court, which leads to another question. Um, I'm not sure that Congress has to start the constitutional amendment process. In fact, I think it can originate in state legislatures. Um, your, your broader point about transportation and the internet and everything else shrinking the world, what would our forefathers do? Um, I think that's exactly the right question. When you're struggling to find a way to interpret this document and you hear some justices say living, breathing, and you hear Scalia talk about original intent, and you hear statutory construction and all of that, the one that makes the most sense to me is if the folks who wrote this were here today looking at what we're looking at, listening to what we're listening to, what would they say? It's hard to do that. It's hard to transport them. But what was the intent of what they did? And what would the conclusion be? Uh, there are a number of ways to sort out uh, citizenship and immigration status. It's just that the body I serve in hasn't chosen to take uh, opportunity to do any of them. And historically, um, that has been the interpretation, that if you're born here, and I, don't, I don't know the data. I don't know how many people are born here and immediately fly back somewhere else. I, I, if I just had a child, I wouldn't want to be on an airplane. But uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, do you believe that students should have the right to carry concealed weapons on college campuses, and why or why not? Um, do I believe that student on the college campuses? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I, but I also think this, um, that, you know, there and gets to the tension between the Tenth Amendment and the Second Amendment, doesn't it? Whether or not that's a decision that ought to be made by USC Upstate, whether it ought to be made for the by the state of South Carolina, and it is the Second Amendment, and you don't have 50 different versions of the First Amendment or the Fourth Amendment or the Eighth Amendment, so why would you have 50 different versions of the Second Amendment? You wouldn't. Um, but can government place reasonable restrictions? I mean, you can't take a gun into the courthouse. So what level of analysis would be proper when you have a constitutional right, which you do to carry a firearm, and government wants to place a limitation on that, you have three options. You have the rational basis test, you have intermediate scrutiny, or you have strict scrutiny. And because a constitutional right is at issue, I would think the state would have to prove a compelling reason to limit your ability to carry a firearm. That would be the constitutional analysis. Can the state prove a compelling reason to limit your Second Amendment right. 
And I don't know what the courts would do with that. Co proving a compelling interest is very, very hard. Very hard. I think that is actually set by state law, and it may be 18 to own one, but I don't know that because there, there would be exceptions for hunting. I, I don't, that, that would be set by the state. There's no, interestingly enough, and we had this fight, that may be too strong a word, we had this debate with the Reciprocity Act because every state has a different concealed carry permit process. So you could be driving from South Carolina to Maine and you're valid in South Carolina and you're valid in Maine, but you cross through states where you're not valid. And my analysis, although I think the 10th Amendment was written by the same folks who wrote the second one, so um, it, it ought to be paid attention to, it doesn't trump the second. And I don't know that you want 50 different variations of the Fourth Amendment. I mean, we don't have them, so why would you have 50 different variations of the Second Amendment? It's, it's either a protected right, which government has to provide a compelling reason to alter, or it's not. Yeah, my question is more about 40 high school students here also. Uh, if you could share with us how the U.S. Constitution is protected, from unnecessary amendments. I say this because many countries, especially countries where I'm from, which is Venezuela, you know, we got countries where the Constitution is not as protected as it is in the United States. If you can share with all of us how it's protected, I think that, that will help. Well, um, whatever I tell you is probably gonna be wrong because I'll get the percentages wrong, whether it's two thirds or three fourths. Uh, we did vote on trying to add an amendment to uh, the Constitution requiring a balanced budget. Um, I will say this to the students, it is incredibly difficult to amend the Constitution and that's the way they wanted it. So you have to have super majorities in the House and the Senate and then it goes to the state legislatures I guess you could have a constitutional convention, but I don't think there's been one. So it, it, it's hard for a reason. Um, I had somebody come see me a week or so ago because they were unhappy with a child custody uh, decision that had been made by a judge, and they wanted a constitutional amendment that parents, I kid you not, that parents are empowered to make the decisions that are best for their children. And you sit there and think, um, well, yeah, we agree with that, um, but I agree with lots of things. I'm not going to canonize it as, a as an amendment to the Constitution. You look, with the exception of alcohol, you look at what we've done and the setting of congressional salaries, they've been pretty important things. You have the three civil rights amendments, you have women's suffrage, uh, the Bill of Rights are the first ten amendments. Uh, you got a couple of squirrely ones in there with prohibition and then repealing it, and then you've got one that, that, that deals with the salaries and compensation of the lawmakers, but the rest of them are pretty heady things, pretty important things. Uh, the limitations on how long you can serve as president. So it's hard, and it's done that way for a reason, and the last amendment that passed was what year? I would ask Mr. Fain because he's more likely to know. Hey, he's European, so they just kind of recycle uh, governments. They don't actually do the, uh, the amendment process, but it was a while. Congressman Gowdy, uh, thank you for coming and sharing your thoughts with us today. Um, my name is Jim Heenahan. I'm president of Student Government Association here at Upstate. And, uh, on behalf of Student Government, I'd like to thank you for coming. Thank you for letting me come. Um, we had a question uh, for you that's, uh, I guess, perhaps unrelated to your comments, but I'd like to um, extend a hand to you and, and, and offer us as a forum to debate your opponent in the upcoming election. I've spoken with her and she's um, graciously accepted. And uh, I'd like to, I'd like to you know, offer you the same opportunity too. We'd love to host you, the two of you to have the kinds of discussions that you mentioned here that uh, not so much about divisiveness, but, but perhaps a, a, a positive discussion. Be delighted to do it. Just you, if you, if you can, work it where I don't have to cancel things that I have already committed to do, uh, then I would be thrilled and delighted to, anyone has a right to run for any office they want to run for. Yes, sir. And I am thrilled to have a conversation 
uh, with uh, whomever wants to, uh, to have one uh, about the challenges our country faces. Uh, you, uh, this, uh, I don't know whether this is considered an official event or a campaign event, so I don't want to run afoul of the laws, but I'm happy to talk to you um, in the very near, I, it may be denied, I'll need to check, if this is considered official, then I, I can't talk about campaign business. Um, Congressman Gowdy, as a follow-up to the student's question on whether or not they should be allowed to carry firearms, when is it that property rights trump the constitutional amendment because I know that uh, individual business owner can have a no guns allowed sign and as a CWP holder you cannot take your firearm in there so obviously property rights there trumps the second amendment well it's either that or they have it hasn't been challenged just one or the other um, I mean, there are lots of signs that tell you you can't do things at restaurants or other places, and they're there just because they've never been challenged. Uh, I think the government has to go through the same analysis. When you're talking about a bank, um, I would think the government would be in pretty good stead in terms of showing a compelling interest of why you don't want firearms in a bank. Um, you know, the other issue is if it's concealed, then who knows you got it. I mean, I mean, Texas has open carry. We have concealed carry. So I, I don't know that it's a property rights versus Second Amendment analysis as much as it is um, whether it's been challenged and whether or not um, the state can prove a compelling interest, not just an important interest, a compelling interest in limiting that right. And, you know, banks, hospitals, uh, the analysis would be interesting and it would be different. I mean, frankly, the nature of the restaurant might be different, um, whether alcohol were served or not served. That, that would be something judges would look at, I would imagine. I First Congressman Allen, thank you for such a right, entertaining, and erudite explanation of the Constitution. Okay. It's very enjoyable. And then I want to ask you this question. You said um, all those dead white men that created the Constitution back in 1787 could never have foreseen the Internet, uh, never could have foreseen the modern things that have come along. Well, neither could they have foreseen the skyrocketing cost of insurance, health care, and the other things that the Affordable Health Act hopes to eradicate. So why is that not a situation that Congress needs to understand that it's time for Congress to be elastic, to use the term that you use, and see that as something that needs to be dealt with? Since we're listing things that our forefathers could not have envisioned, I don't know that they could have envisioned getting health, having health insurance, period. I don't know that they could have envisioned getting it from your employer, which was a World War II phenomenon. We didn't do it prior to that. Uh, I mean, your point's well taken. Yeah, they, they, they could not have uh, foreseen the challenges to the Constitution. They, they could not have foreseen lots of things. I think it is possible to provide uh, health insurance for all of our citizens and still be respective of the Commerce Clause. And, you know, I, I would rather, and Congress can do this, Congress can collect your tax monies and buy private health insurance. Give me a second. You may not, you, I mean, you may not be crazy about private health insurance, but that you might could do under the tax and spend. But if, I, if, if we can make you purchase health insurance, can I make you purchase dental insurance? And if not, why not? And generational debt is bad. Um, and our forefathers never could have imagined the credit card debts that we would run up. So can we make you get life insurance so you don't pass on generational debt? And I understand health is a, in a little different category. But, you know, to Justice Alito's point, we're all going to die. 
and we don't want to pass on burial costs, so can we mandate that you have burial insurance? I, I, my point is, where does it stop? And and I, and I you know, so I'm, I probably lingered for a long time on the, the difference between a good idea and a proper exercise of our authority. But also repeated twice, I think you're crazy not to have health insurance. And I'm, if you can afford it. And then that gets into the issue of the responsibility or irresponsibility, if you can't afford it, rolling the dice. I think of all the things our forefathers probably did not envision, um, it would be personal responsibility and accountability to others. That um, if I can afford health insurance and I'm not going to get it simply because I know that my costs can be dispersed among you, that's just wrong. And, and if you're indigent and you need health insurance, I would rather pro buy a private policy for you than to mandate that your employer, because I mean, let's assume you and I set up a business tomorrow and we didn't want to offer health insurance at all. We just didn't want to. We weren't sure whether we'd make a profit. Uh, it's, you know, it's, we couldn't find a policy with a high enough deductible. We're just not offering it. We're gonna give our employees enough money that they can go in the market and buy what they want, but we're not gonna provide it. Can we do that? I'm not, I am not quarreling with you on the importance of having health insurance, uh, especially for um, folks who cannot afford it. I just want to do it in a way where we do not start down a slope where all I have to do is prove that if I make you get something, cost is going to be shared and we're going to be better off. I just, then, then, I don't, I don't know what the limitation means. Why are there certain age restrictions when a minor could have more mental capability or knowledge in a certain area than a legal adult, such as voting, or because some people may just vote for someone because of a name, while a minor may actually know who they're voting for and why they're voting for them? It's a conspiracy to keep young people down. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, you have to give certain allowances. There are people who probably are able to drive at 14, and then there are people who are 40 and still have not figured out how to drive. So you have to necessarily paint with a broad brush. And the, I will leave it to the experts in, in brain development. Um, we do not hold young people to the same standards that we hold adults in the criminal justice system. We don't hold you to the same standard in terms of your conduct. That's why we have a juvenile justice system and an adult uh, justice system. So yes, you may not be able to vote, but you also don't have to go to big boy prison and you gotta decide whether or not that trade-off is acceptable or not. Thanks for being here, Congressman. Thank uh, you. My question has to do with the uh, Equal Protection Clause uh, as it relates to the uh, photo ID uh, voter controversy uh, going on recently. Uh, the state of, Con of South Carolina, of course, has been uh, restricted by the federal government uh, to, to apply that law that they passed here. Uh, but it's also my understanding that there are several states that already have photo ID laws. So why doesn't the Equal Protection Clause apply to all the states equally? Uh, well, because there is something called the Voting Rights Act that um, is a conversation for another day. But I do want to say well, this. My question then goes back to that should be uh, equal protection under the law also. That should apply to all the states also. Right. I'm, I'm playing the devil's advocate here for just a minute because uh, come November I may, I may need a job as an adjunct professor. So I want to let them know that I'm capable of thinking the other side. Again, it is, not, it is not per se unconstitutional for me to treat one group differently from another. He just proved that we treat one group differently than we do another. We're not about to let those kids vote, are we? And we're not going to let them drive until they get a certain age, and we're not going to let them drink until we get a certain age. I mean, we treat people differently. 
The question is whether or not government has a compelling interest in doing so. And my guess is they would tell you the Voting Rights Act, and look, despite the number of gray hair I have, I was not in Congress when they, when they passed the Voting Rights Act. And my, my issue with the Voting Rights Act is this. Do you know what state has the highest percentage of African-American congressmen? Not the highest number, the highest percentage of any state in the union? You're in it. One-third of our delegation is African-American. One Republican, one Democrat. The place where the, war, the Civil War started is now represented by Tim Scott. So what I would like is a way for states like South Carolina to purge itself, to cleanse itself, to prove that we have mechanisms in place where we do not need the Department of Justice to pre-clear and approve what we do, whether it's a redistricting map. I mean, you look at our redistricting maps and you look at the maps in other states, um, they're equally gerrymandered. They're equally designed to protect incumbents, but one has to be pre-cleared and the other does not. With respect to voter, uh, uh, voter IDs, I'm going to harken back to the job I used to have, which is motive. The motive of the actor. If I accidentally open that door and it hits you in the head, it's going to hurt. You're not going to be as mad as you would be as if I intentionally timed it to do it when you were walking through the door. It's going to hurt, and you're going to be furious. I think what the courts look at is the motive of the actors, the states. Is it designed to protect against fraud, or is it designed to suppress votes? And it's our job as a state to convince the judge that it's designed to protect the integrity of the system. Uh, Georgia, the number of African Americans voting went up after they had voter ID. Indiana's law was found to pass constitutional muster. I don't know why South Carolina, I haven't talked to Alan Wilson in a couple of months about it. I, the last conversation I had with Alan was this. I have to have an ID to get into Eric Holder's office, to his building. To get into his building, you have to show a photo ID. I do not feel at all discriminated against by doing that. And if, and, and keep in mind, not to dwell on this, but the facts do matter. Facts matter. The court found that African Americans in South Carolina, by a percentage of less than 1%, are less likely to have a form of ID that would enable them to vote, less than 1%. Well, that necessarily means that that same group is statistically less able to board airplanes and statistically less able to gain entrance into federal courts, but nobody's challenging their ability to access the court system. South Carolina also has a mechanism by which you can vote even if you don't have an ID, a provisional ballot. So without going off on a soapbox, the reason I liked my other job is it really didn't matter what your politics were. It's facts, it's motive, it's evidence. Uh, you know, I'll leave it up to you whether or not you think departments of justice past, present, uh, treat certain states differently than they do other states. I'll let you figure that out. We have, we have three or four more questions, but I know that, that your time is, is pressed. Would you have time to answer a couple more questions? It's not breakfast yet, is it? Not yet. That's okay. It. And I'll keep running this microphone around as long as people want, ask questions. I'll, 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 whoever's in the queue, I'm, ha I'm happy to answer them and then I'll. Okay. Okay. Last I've got four more. Okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Richard Mahler. I'm a senior communications major here at USC Upstate. Um, uh, you had voted for uh, HCON Resolution 34. You voted in favor. Uh, the budget suggests that cutting Pell Grants uh, will reduce the cost of tuition and then virtually um, evidence to the, is always to the contrary. Um, two noteworthy studies of the relationship between federal student aid and tuition produced by both George W. Bush and George um, Bill Clinton uh, found that there's no link between federal student aid and tuition increases. I just want to know, being a congressman from a district that holds so many colleges, 
why you would vote for such a measure? Well, um, one thing that you would know uh, up front is I didn't do it to curry political points uh, because I do have a lot of colleges and a lot of students, so I, I must have thought it was the right thing to do, and here's why. Student indebtedness is higher than it has ever been. The default rate is higher than it has ever been. Uh, and look, I love your chancellor, and he's going to throw something at me for saying this, so I'm just going to ask him to keep his ears closed. I think you're crazy to focus on the interest rate that you pay. You, would, you should focus much more attention on what the tuition rate is. Would you rather pay 6.8 on $20,000 or 3.4 on $100,000? That gets into the whole issue of whether or not you want the federal government uh, subsidizing uh, loan rates. Uh, I think education's phenomenal. I wouldn't be here without it. But transportation's phenomenal. Are we going to subsidize those rates? Housing is phenomenal. Are we gonna, where does it end? And between you paying less tuition and a higher interest rate as opposed to a lower interest rate and higher tuition, I would keep the 6.8 and pay less tuition. Uh, I understand what you were saying about the whole common interest thing, but can Congress pass laws that affect private companies and if it helps, say, common people or anything like that? Uh, give me an example only because I'm slow. Uh, like lowering tuition costs, for example. Wow. Um, I'll try to give a different spin to the answer. Um, I actually have a child who's in college, so it is in my best interest to have the lowest interest rate possible. Um, I want each of you to get out of, law, uh, get out of school and law school and graduate school, whatever you want to do, with as little debt as you can. Uh, debt is demoralizing, and uh, I had an office full of prosecutors who had to make career decisions based on debt and not based on what they wanted to do. I was sharing with somebody in the other room, uh, my son was admitted to and almost attended a college that cost $47,000 a year. So my question to you is, first of all, what's 47 times four? It's a lot, right? It's like 188? All right, would you rather be $188,000 in debt at 3.4% interest? I mean, I got you a great interest rate. It's low. You wanna be $188,000 in debt, just tuition with a low interest rate? Or do you want us to do something about tuition? And again, it does not make me, look, I love your chancellor. I like Betsy at Converse. I like Bernie Dunlap. They're all my friends. It's not a popular vote, but it's what I believe. I, I, I think you're crazy to try to borrow as much money you can at a low interest rate. I think you ought to focus on the principal and not the interest. I will, I will refer you back to Mr. Fain's question about requiring private insurance companies to provide certain things in their health insurance policies. Apparently, they do have the power to do that if it's an area where they are already regulating. If it's a channel of commerce, an instrumentality of commerce, a stream of commerce where Congress is, I mean, they do it with banks. I mean, banks are private entities, but Congress passes laws that impact them. Trucking companies are private entities, but Congress passes laws that say you can't stay up on methamphetamine for 24 straight hours. You gotta sleep every now and again. So I don't know that you can go into a field that has heretofore not been occupied by Congress. But if Congress can occupy that field, then yes, they can do something even if it impacts a private entity. And I'm sorry I misunderstood your question. That is not the first time that has happened. This may be a general question, but can an amendment be completely eradicated from the Constitution? It's been done. Uh, how, do, how do you think you can drink in South Carolina? I meant can it be complete? It may be. Expunged where there's no record of it? Yes. Do you know anybody in the media? 
I mean, do you really think we could keep that a secret? <laughs> I, I don't think we can expunge it because I think we want uh, young, studious um, people like yourself to want to know what we were thinking at that time and why we changed our minds. I'm really not a fan of expunging much. I mean, if you've been charged with a crime and you were not guilty, I think that should be expunged. Beyond that? Hi. Hey. Um, my name is Nia. I'm a Spanish education major and German studies English minor here. Can um, you say all that again? <laughs> I, I major in secondary Spanish education and I'm a minor in German studies and English. Um, my question is, how do you feel on nuclear nonproliferation as a young adult in this age, I think that's the most pressing issue to world safety. Um, we have a lot of countries that are selling um, selling materials that can make nuclear weapons, and I feel that as a country with the highest stockpile, high, biggest arsenal, we're not making a big enough deal about it. Um, if one country does anything again with a nuclear weapon, we've only used it twice. Um, the chance is 99.9% .9 chance that somebody else is gonna use it, and then we'll all die. So, what remedy would you propose for me as we go back up tomorrow? Well, I mean, do I've you agree this. that it is the preeminent responsibility of the federal government to provide for the national security? Once again, sir, I'm sorry. Do you believe that no matter what role Congress has in this area or that, the preeminent role is to provide for the national security? I think that might be the executive branch. Um, but I, I'm talking maybe the United Nations, we should, yes, sir. <laughs> um, I understand that we play like the largest role in the United Nations, but worldwide, I think How's that, that been working out for us? <laughs> debt, more debt. <laughs> well, no, it's not just debt either. It's, uh, you know, I look, I, I don't really care that much about polls, but uh, the president's popularity is down in all of the countries right now where they're, uh, where civil war is, is breaking out. So despite making a concerted effort to present a different world image. I don't think it's our job to, we have our, we have our constitution, it's amazing. Other countries should maybe follow that role. It's not our job to make their laws. Is it your job to tell them what weapons they can have? No, but nuclear weapons, that's a serious thing. So, so are serious. tanks. I mean, guns yeah. kill more people each year than nuclear weapons yeah. do. Yeah. You want to you want to go to you, I hate nuclear weapons. Uh, can Israel have them? I think they do. Can they? They sh See that's that's such a pressing issue because we have them, China has them, uh, Russia has them, but now Pakistan. If you want yeah. something to keep you up Pakistan at night, Pakistan has it. Pakistan is serious. Pakistan is no joke, y'all. So you want us to have them but tell everybody else they cannot. I don't want us to have cannot. them at all. We Do you trust yeah. other countries? Let's assume I don't trust anybody with them. Let's assume that this island called Utopia yes, exist, yes. and that we did away with all of our nuclear weapons. Do you trust the other countries to do the same? I think we should work together to do that. Um, like, after the Fukushima meltdown, a lot of Japanese citizens are protesting against that because they were using it for, for great purposes. But well, now, as the if you were to put a nuclear site... Yes, sir where it is not on an earthquake fault line and it's not susceptible to a tsunami, yes, sir. would you then be a fan of nuclear energy? No, no, we, we have such limited resources and ever since the Industrial Revolution, we've been using those resources at, at a, a, a bajillion times faster than they are produced. Did you drive here? No, I walked from the villas. Do you have a car? I have an old minivan. <laughs> I want you to pour water in the car the next time you go to fill up and let me know how that works out. Do we use nuclear power to drive? Oh, gas. Yeah, okay, gas is a problem too, but gas isn't going to kill me. Gas isn't going to blow up the earth. And um, here's the, let me say this. You are extremely bright. I want and, to learn more about this. That's why I'm just asking. Well, and sir. I want to talk to you about it. I and, want you and to talk you, in Congress about nuclear nonproliferation, I want you to come talk to us about it. But. Pinky promise. <laughs> Pinky promise. Pinky promise. I, I would love for you to come talk to me about it. Yes, sir. But, but I, want you, I want you to uh, think about this tonight. After you do your homework and after you read that book I told you to read. 
You need my email address. I want, <laughs> give it to me. I want you to think about the fact that there have been more people your age killed in Chicago this week oh, yeah. than have ever died in this country because of a nuclear accident. Yeah, they have a lot of gang problems. Well, it's violence. not just Chicago. I mean, anywhere. I mean, drunk, you're more at a risk from a drunk driver than you are from, I mean, the fear is great because of Chernobyl and Three Mile Island. Yes, and what happened in Japan, the fear is great. Yes, yeah, so that, that could happen anywhere in America, too. We have How are you going zones? to power this? I mean, think about the countries that are trying to develop, the African countries, the, the former Soviet bloc that want to become what we are, and they're going to look at us and say, you mean we can't have energy? You had it for yeah. 200 years, but we can't have it? Maybe we, the UN could use the energy. Why don't we keep, we'll continue the conversation afterwards. I look forward to it. Thanks. Well, Congressman, Congressman, we have one more question, sir. One more question. I'm, I'm sorry for... No more pinky promises, though. Oh, oh, oh my. Uh, Lord Cunningham, I'm a retired high school teacher and a retired broadcaster. And um, I thank you for being here, Con Congressman Gowdy. I am one of your biggest fans, watching you with Kathleen Zabelius. Back in March, when the Blunt Amendment, for the, as part of the Affordable Care Act, the HHS mandate came up and mandates that all employers, as you know, must provide contraception. They must add to their insurance benefits. Oh, and by the way, I'm a ins licensed insurance person, too. Um, they must add to their insurance benefits contraception, sterilization, and abortion-inducing drugs, which goes against our, the, our First Amendment freedom of um, religion rights. And I am absolutely dumbfounded that this is going on, that we haven't seen more happening, um, more reactions going on, because, okay, the Blunt Amendment of the House went with it, and then the Senate turned it down, and then I was so upset, I mounted a rally in Greenville. We had 500 people show up. Um, my, my concern is, why aren't we hearing more? Because right now, there should be employers uh, all over that are having to adjust and add these benefits against those that are, are, don't believe in abortion, against their, their consciences. What is going on? Well, um you are correct to note that there was a lot uh, written and said about it uh, at the time the rule was first promulgated uh, by uh, Secretary Sebelius and HHS. Uh, it's now in the court system, and uh, the Beckett Fund, which handles a lot of the religious uh, liberty um, litigation, uh, won the first case. And I talked about it Friday night. Um, I talked about it in a judiciary hearing. Now, this came as a shock to my mother, but every speech I give is not covered by the media. That <laughs> blew me away that that did not happen. But there are people talking about it. Um, we just can't dictate whether, you know, we can't dictate what makes the news, but there are people still talking about it. But what I want to get you to do is focus on the law, because that's what the Constitution and the legal structure is, is the only way I know to go about this. My, my party, my side of the aisle, made a huge error by not allowing someone to speak in a committee hearing. So then it morphs into a war on women. And the reality is it's a very simple constitutional analysis. Does government have a compelling interest in providing free contraception? Is it a compelling interest? And even if you answer that yes, which I haven't had anyone yet be able to say why that is yes, is it the least restrictive means of providing it? And it's so clear that the answer to that question is no, if Congress wanted to provide free contraception, whatever that means, then they would have voted to do it. They wouldn't make insurance or employers do it. We would have voted to do it, but we didn't. It's a political issue. But it isn't just the contraception. It's, it's abortifacients. It's, it's, it's all of the above. It's all of the, uh, look, I, look I, I, we had a hearing on what we perceived 
uh, it's being litigated by the, by, by the group that Hamilton worried wasn't going to be powerful enough. It's in the courts. What happened to Fast and Furious that Eric Holder is still... Got, it, got, got a hearing tomorrow afternoon. The IG report will be released at 2 o'clock tomorrow. So we're, we're trying. Thanks. I'd like to thank the congressman for his address and for being with us tonight, and thank all of you for being here with us all as well.